So next up, uh, we have Sean Cohen, who is the director of digital at Creative Link, uh, which is a boutique digital design and development agency in San Antonio. <clears throat> Sean Cohen. Good luck. So, so whoever asked the, the question about competitive competitors, all that, um, I owe you like drinks or lunch or something because it's a perfect lead into my, to my talk today. Um, I'm going back to this slide because if I could hug the screen, I would, I would hug the screen. I love SEM Rush. If you're not a subscriber, become a subscriber like before you leave here because it's an amazing tool. So before we talk about uh, digital competitive analysis, we're going to talk about something really sweet. The 2016 Ford Mustang GT, 435 horsepower. 3,705 pounds of torque, which is basically like if Serena Williams, 30 of her, were turning your wheels for you 100 times a second, that's what you would get with the Mustang GT. The greatest thing about it, it comes in 10 colors. Now, that's an odd thing to say in 2015 for a 2016 model car, but if we go back 107 years, Henry Ford said, any customer can have a car painted any color he wants as long as it's black. Duh. Well, why did he say this? He said this because cars took about two weeks to get paint to once they were painted to be dry back in, two, in, back in uh, 1908. And he said, look, if we do this new, use this new paint from DuPont, it dries in a couple hours. And so for, uh, for all of our Ford Model Ts, because they only had one model back then, they're all gonna be black, and I don't care if somebody wants another color, they're gonna get black. Imagine being the senior sales staff in that meeting when he just kind of popped that on you. Okay, so we get to sell one model and one color. That's gonna go over really well. But that was Ford's strategy every year for the next 19 years. Uh-oh. Tech help. Maybe I'll need to, what do I need to do? Anybody? I don't have a mouse. This is like, what do I do with this? Is it coming back up? Okay, great. Um, so in case you were wondering, they did have cars of different colors before, before everything went black. But then everyone adopted that because no one wanted their cars sitting at the manufacturing plant for a, for a couple weeks waiting to get dry while these Fords are on the lot getting sold. In 1921, the dude in the center, Alfred P. Sloan, took over as president of General Motors. And uh, General Motors, all their cars were, were, were black at that point. And as soon as he took over, it took him about two seconds for him to say, fuck that shit, we're having colored cars. <laughs> so that's what they did. They came out with dozens of colors. They also partnered with DuPont, but they took it one step further. Um, there's a 25 Caddy, pretty sweet. And they even had racing stripes back then, <laughs> just like the Mustang does today. Well, um, it took Henry Ford about five years to get his shit together, but finally when he did, he said, oh wow, our cars aren't selling well in just one, you know, one model, so we've gotta, we've gotta step up our game and come out with four different models here. And so uh, that's what they did. They came out with the Model A and then sales shot back up. But if you want to motivate a client or an executive, just show them what the competition is doing. And that's really the basis of what we're going to talk about today. Now, before we specifically look at competitive analysis and content gap analysis, what I want to do is introduce a principle that I think as marketers we really need to be aware of, and it's, and it's finding the story in the data. Now, this isn't going to contradict what Ian said earlier. Um, I, I like what he had to say. But uh, what we're talking about here is finding the potential to connect with the user with the data that we have at hand. A couple examples of that. A client that I worked with, they have a financial technology software. It, it, it helps CFOs of, like their minimum threshold is half a billion dollars in revenue per year on up. So um, if you make you know, 499, billion, or 499 million a year, we're not interested, we just want the 500 million on up. But it helps them make quicker decisions. Well, the problem was um, they had a lead form on their site that was working really well. Tons of leads coming in, but 
pushing people down the funnel to actually become a customer was challenging. Email marketing is a really easy way to make that happen. So my first question when they came to us with that problem is, where's the data? What data do we have? I said, well, um, we use Pardot. You know, it's a lead scoring software. It's sort of a CRM. We have 127,000 leads in there. Like, could you use that? I'm like, uh, yeah, I wanna, I wanna look at your 127,000 leads. So um, each of the awesome thing about each of those leads is that they had a job title associated with them. So I, I took the, the, from that Excel spreadsheet that I got, I took all the job titles, put them in a word cloud, and found out, huh, CIOs are interested in what we have to offer, CFOs, IT directors, and then a whole bunch of other people as well. But the word cloud really helped me see, and we could have you know, done a count if, like how many times did CFO show up in Excel, but this was a lot more fun and visual. And this is even exaggerated a little bit, but you know, you get the point. We then were able to say, okay, with that data, we now can step back and say, all right, if we're gonna start an email marketing program, we have to talk to the needs of the CIO, the needs of the CFO, what their pain points are, and the IT director, because if we're gonna implement software, even though it's financial, IT is gonna have to be involved, shared services, all that fun stuff. But visualizing that data really helped us see where we needed to start with our email marketing program. Another thing, using trends, and this is um, what, some of what, what SEM Rush, Rush does for us. So I know how to look at a spreadsheet like this. You probably do too, if you're familiar with, with SEM Rush and some of the other ranking softwares out there. We have, we have a keyword. This is, um, I pulled GE's keywords here. I don't work for GE. I guess this is free publicity, but. Um, we have keywords, we have where, where we rank for that particular keyword, we have the search volume for that keyword, and then the URL um, that is actually ranking for that keyword. But then over on the right, we have, we have all of these numbers. And I looked at these numbers for years and I was like, I failed math in high school, I don't know what to do with numbers, so just show me words and I'll be, I'll be happy. But then I started to look at it and what it's actually telling me is the trends by month for that particular keyword. So the keyword that we looked at, Six Sigma, it gets 60,500 searches a month. Some months it might get 100,000 searches. Other months it might get 30. So what can I do? What can I do with that data? How can I tie it, for instance, Jobs for Veterans with this trend data that SEM Rush is giving me? Well, this is what I did. I took that keyword, created a spark line in Excel, and if you don't know how to do spark lines, tons of good um, instruction there on the web. And suddenly realize, oh wow, we spike in August and we, we dip in March. So what do you know? Maybe I should post about jobs for veterans in August when it's a really popular keyword. And then when it's not as popular, I should find out something else to do in my blogging or my social strategy. So now getting into actual competitive and content gap analysis. So we've, we've set the stage and said, look, we really need to use the data that's, that's at hand to inform, inform our marketing. Not a new concept, but something that sometimes doesn't translate into, into the campaigns that we launch or the things that we recommend to our clients or to our internal clients if we're in-house marketers. The marketing mix is complex. It starts, I feel like it starts with branding. We have to know who we are. Then it gets into objectives. Business objectives, marketing objectives. Then we have to understand just within digital what our goals, objectives, and KPIs are just for digital. Then from there, being for me, being from the SEO side of things, I always go back to the keywords. What do people, people care about? What are, they, what are they searching for? Tons of great resources online, so not gonna spend a, a lot of time on that. From there, this is where we get into our content and competitive analysis. We have to understand what our goals are, what we want to accomplish, and then from there, look at the keywords that are tying to those goals, and then see what the, com the competition is doing. From there, we can get into content strategy, making the money, and then test and learn strategies, what, did, what we did, how did it work, uh, did it work well, did it, did it not work well, what failed, what succeeded. But then beyond that, we have all of this within the digital marketing sphere that we've, that we've got to look at. Unfortunately, time doesn't allow us to, to cover all this, but um, kind of like what, what uh, I believe Ruth was talking about 
it's not just SEO or paid media just isn't one thing. It's got to fit within the overall sphere of what our, what our marketing goals are. And all these that I put up here are pretty much digital. So it shows how, how multifaceted the landscape is within digital. So we're just looking at one tiny sliver of that today. So what is competitive analysis? It, it really comprises two things. Who's beating me? And how are they beating me? What keywords are they beating me on? And then from there we say, what's content gap analysis? What content is winning? And then how can I create better content to do, that's gonna perform better than what my competition is putting out there? Easier said than done to, to find out what the competition is doing if we don't have the tools that we're gonna go over in a minute. Now sometimes if you have a really kick-ass creative team, like at the agency that I work at, probably where you work at as well. Um, ideas are a dime a dozen. You're, just, you're, you're pumping out ideas, you're pumping out ideas, but if they're the wrong idea, that, that isn't going to overtake our, our competitors in you know, the search engine results, then we're really wasting our time if our goal is digital. So the old process. I have used this process, I'm guilty of it. You might use this process as well for competitive analysis. We identify the keywords we wanna rank for. We do our keyword research, all right. But then we type those keywords manually into Google, or we, if we know how to use SEMrush, we type them manually into SEMrush and we get all the data that's available there. But we do it one at a time, one at a time. Then we rely on our gut level feelings. We know deep down we don't have the full picture, but we're kind of like, Ugh, they're only paying me for, you know, the client's only giving me about two hours. We only have two or three hours allotted for this whole competitive analysis. I've already used an hour for, for keyword research. I just don't have any more time. We've got to move on. We've got to execute. We've got to launch. And then I might get an idea of my domain level competitors but they're only gonna be my direct competitors. The ones that maybe I don't overlap at all with in, in, in keywords, I'm not gonna have really any idea who they are. And because of that, um, and then the content gap analysis, based on that limited sliver of understanding that I have of, of what's happening in the overall sphere, I search for the keywords I wanna rank for. Maybe they're competitive, maybe they aren't, but I know these are, these are, our goal, these are what are gonna help us reach our goals. Then I look for patterns. Okay, what's, what's working? But again, these patterns are within that, within that small understanding that I have. Then I produce the content to hopefully beat the competitors. Now, is it a little bit of a shot in the dark? Absolutely. And so the process that, that I've been implementing for a while now is, is taking us to have a more full view of, of what, um, what we need to have as we, as we do our competitive analysis and identify what gaps in content we have on our website. So this process, obviously, there are a lot of negatives to it. The new process has a lot of advantages, and so um, hopefully I can sell you on that. Now, the, the thing that, that this new process does so well is, okay, I have my keyword set that I identified. I'm a good, I'm a good digital marketer. I have a good idea of, of what I want to rank for. So I see, okay, competitor one is overlapping me, with me this much. Competitor two kind of overlaps both of us. Competitor three, maybe it's just kind of off by itself. But then there's this other competitor that is competing with, not with me directly, but there's probably some growth there in their keywords. And then maybe even in the competitor's competitor's competitor. And ad infinitum, which I wanted all my circles to show. Okay, so what does this process do for us? It enables us to aggregate thousands of SERP results, search engine results, page results, just the 10 results in Google. It enables us to bring them all together within Excel in a matter of minutes. So what was painstaking to take hours to do and we only had a limited understanding of what the competition was doing, now we get that full perspective and we can go out further and further as we wanna grow. You know, we get our shit together on our first keywords and we go from there and this process shows us where we can go next. It organizes all those results by domain and URL. So I can see if, um, if uh, I'm in the air conditioning business and I'm working for Lennox, let's say, I can see exactly where American Standard is beating me. I can see where Train is beating me. And I can see it on a, on a large scale. I can also see where I'm beating them and maybe I can bump up a little bit further if I augment the content that I have on my page. 
then I, I incorporate that, that key data, like search volume, and then keyword difficulty for Moz. Um, so let's get, let's get into this. A uh, little bit short on time. So I've done this for a client or two, maybe three or four, and um, we had a problem on this one page. We weren't, we weren't growing in our rankings, and we weren't um, growing in organic traffic. It just said stagnated. So what do we got to do? We got to get better. We got we to gotta do it better. This was our current state. 25 keywords represented across 2,800 searches per month. So when we implemented our recommendations based on, on doing this process, our keywords doubled, our search volume increased, the, the number of keywords we, we were ranking for and the searches that those represented, and then the organic traffic tripled. So it actually, it actually works. That, that's the whole point of this a success story. So why did it work? Why did I know that it should be 800 words and not 500 or 1,000, maybe 3,000? Why did I know that we just needed text and not rich media, which we could have spent thousands of dollars on. Because what we did was looked at 250 keywords that we could possibly rank for, and we saw exactly what Google was already preferring. And then that made it crystal clear to say, look, this is exactly what we need to do, and we just need to do it a little bit better. Now, is the goal to be you know, if everyone's mediocre, is it to be like mediocre plus one? Of course not, but we know there are budget constraints, there are time constraints, all of these constraints, but at least we can say, okay, this is the minimum, this is the minimum product you have to put out there that's going to increase our traffic or increase our keyword volume, et cetera, et cetera. So what I do, this is, might sound scary, but we have to hook into the SEMrush API. If you have a subscription to the API, easy as pie which um, I might take you up on that pie offer, Ian, maybe. Um, what that enables us to do is pull in all the keywords that I possibly want to rank for, and then all the keywords that my competitors are ranking for as well. And then we analyze those results and make the necessary changes or the necessary recommendation to the website. So this is the process. Required skills and subscriptions. Subscriptions first, just two of them. SEM Rush and Moz. We all love Moz, I love SEM Rush. can't speak uh, highly enough about it. Excel skills you need, VLOOKUP and pivot tables. If you don't know how to do these, again, um, if you live in Excel, you probably know how to do these already. If you're kind of getting your feet wet, next logical step for you is to learn how to do these. Um, Any Cushing, Analytics.com, excellent resource on both of these. Wonderful video, I learned from her, watching her stuff on Search Engine Land, all that. And then um, you have to know how to turn add-ins on and off because the API will run every time you open Excel and you'll wonder, ah, what happened to my Excel? You just have to remember to turn it on and off. So SEM Rush, the interface, type in a domain, type in a URL, individual keyword. It gives you, you, for instance, if you type in a keyword like jobs for veterans, it'll show you the top 20 results for that particular keyword. So it looks like a spreadsheet like this. So I get the keywords the positions that I rank for, the search volume for each of those keywords, and the individual URL that I rank for. Now, something that you need to do on the Excel side is go to build, really search, build, or actually I have a, a, a bit.ly for it, SEO gadget dash add dash in. Go to that link, it'll take you to the SEO gadget page. An add-in is something you can put into Excel to basically make Excel work on steroids, it, it's, it's really cool. So once you've got SEO Gadget, the SEO Gadget Excel add-in installed, all you have to do is take your keywords, copy and paste them into this document that's at this link down here, SERP underscore analysis. And what that does, once you hit calculate, it'll run through and pull the top 10 results for all of the keywords that you rank for and all the ones you want to rank for. So we've taken, what we've done is taken what was a painstaking process and pulled 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 search results into one. We can, we can pop that into, a, into its own page, which it does, and then we go to Moz Keyword Difficulty, take all those keywords again and pull the difficulty score. Um, my, my theory is, if you're not familiar with Moz difficulty, they've attached a difficulty score to every keyword known to man. Pretty much anything you want to rank for, 
there's a keyword, there's a keyword difficulty score for it. It's a zero to 100% scale. My theory is that if I, if I put all of my keywords that I currently rank for, am I into Moz difficulty? And the average of that is maybe 35%. I can launch maybe the best content out there for a keyword that's at 75% and, and I'm 75% difficulty. I'm probably not going to rank for it. There's a good chance I'm going to rank for keyword that have keywords that have a difficulty of 39% if my average is 35%, but I'm probably not going to make that huge, huge jump. Now, um, if anyone has data to, to, to show differently, that's, that's cool. I would love to see it. But from my experience, that's pretty much the case. So why does that become important? Because over on, on the left, I have my domain. I have the URL that's ranking. And these are the actual results from Google across 300 keywords, across 200 and some keywords. This maxes out at 300. Um, this tool, if you can create one that, that's, that's better than that off of this template, awesome. Be my guest and share it with me, because I would love to use it. Over on the right, we have the keywords that each URL ranks for, and then we have the difficulty for each. When I put them into a pivot table, this is where it gets cool because I can see, based on that keyword list, exactly who I need to be in just a matter of minutes. And I can also see, when I bring in difficulty, I can see what's the, what's the average difficulty that this, that this URL ranks for. So um, what a friend of mine came to me a couple months ago and said, I want to start an SMB consulting website. So it's going to have like links to tools. It's going to have some tips. It's going to be really cool. Do the whole like SEO competitive thing for me and just see who I'm up against for the keywords that I want to rank for. OK, well, you're competing against Facebook. <laughs> Probably not who you would like to begin competing against. So we're, we'd have to go in and say, OK, those keywords, probably not your first option for what you want to rank for. Difficulties in, in, the, in the 50 some percent when you first launch, even if you have awesome content, you have an awesome website, your keyword difficulty level is probably going to be somewhere around 25 percent. So let's look at those keywords that apply and focus on building content around those rather than, than going up against Facebook and about.com and Houston Chronicle. So this enables us to evaluate the most authoritative URLs that are, that are out there. We can then make observations. So we see the content type. Is there word, what's the word count? Is, is there rich media? And then I can analyze the inbound links with Moz or Majestic or any of the other tools that enable link analysis, inbound link analysis. And I can see, OK, did, this, did this, the, this URL, did it get a lot of links? Does it rank well as well? Did it get a lot of social traction? Whatever. And then I can, what I do is take my observations for each keyword and say, look, um, average, average number of, of words on this, on this particular keyword for the top 10 results is, is about 500. We should be looking at doing more than that. We should be looking at maybe building a whole, a whole ebook or launching some rich media. But if there are constraints on budget and our competitors don't have any rich media out there, we might not need to launch with that. We maybe can just augment our current 300 words with another 300 words, and, the, and it lowers the cost for the client, and then enables them still to, to achieve their goals and, and growth. Then we make the content recommendation. So again, Excel skills you have to learn is VLOOKUP, which that basically says if I have two columns of, of data over here and two columns over here, and there's a match on them, I can bring this other content over there. Again, a lot of good resources there. Um, Pivot tables, extremely important to bring all the data together and sort by keyword that I want to rank for or sort by the URL that's beating me the most by 30 keywords that I'm not ranking for. And then, like I said, turning add-ins on and off. So what, what we have here, again, is granularly, granularly digging into the content that we need to launch with or the content that we need to augment on our website to help us reach our goals. And without a, a, a comprehensive view of what the competition is doing out there, it, it raises the stakes for, or raises the risk for us to make mistakes, to not see the full picture, to launch with the wrong content, to launch with content that, that is kind of out of our league for who we want to compete with. So three things. 
Do yourself a favor and view large amounts of data at once. Don't waste time that, that the client isn't paying you for and then go out and beat the hell out of the competition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Absolutely. Let me turn my mic on. Yes. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> He's grateful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Now, that was awesome. That is ex I'm a big data wonk. <clears throat> That's exactly my kind of uh, analysis. And, awesome. and um, a question from earlier, how do you justify this to a, a small business or uh, to any kind of stakeholder? Um, this gives you the kind of data that is just undeniable. You it look does. at this kind of search traffic exactly. for these kind of keywords, right. and you start saying, yep. um, well, we need to rank for that. There's yeah. so many people searching. Oh, gosh, let's, let's go in. And, and we also have done things a bit like this, and the return on investment is, is, is massive, I believe. Yes, so, it is. Um, it takes a little bit of... Um, uh, it takes Fiddling a little bit, with the data. Yeah. Right. So the, my question to you is, who should do this kind of thing? Because you've got two people here, right? You've got a technically minded data brain, and then you've got the content guy who's going to write it at the end of the day. Is that the same person? Are these two separate people? How do you guys structure that? Yeah, so depending on the setup, uh, sometimes it might need, need to be the same person. I, I like to let content writers write content because they do the best job at it. The favor that we can do to them with this is to say, look, this is, this is who we need to be. So how can we make our content more useful to the, to the end user? Because the content writer is going to know who he or she is writing for. So if we can at least show them the results that are winning right now, right. they can come in and say, oh, well, we could do this and that. And oh, we haven't, we, haven't, we haven't even touched this pain point that the user has or the target demographic has. So if it can be two different people, that's ideal. But if it needs to be the same person, at least we can do the best job we can with all the data that we have available to us. Okay, right.